Hi, welcome back to Find Me in a Book podcast. This is episode three. We are going to be talking about window shopping from Tessa Bailey. And I loved it. I feel like I'm going to be saying this for every episode because I am pretty much only going to do the books that I love. So just expect me to say that I love the book at the beginning of every episode. We're just going to jump right in. This was a really like pretty quick read. It um, is definitely not a slow burn like the past book. It is very quick. It is very steamy. It is spicy. It has a great storyline. Would I recommend it to my sister? You know, I think she could read it. I think it might be a bit too spicy for her that she would probably need to like swipe through it. For my mom, probably not. It's it's a bit too spicy. But when we talk about spicy, it's not like crude. It's not a demeaning spicy. It's a very much like, hey, this is romance. This is their story. This is how they fall in love. It has a lot of sexual tension. And we're going to learn all about it. We're going to look, learn about their storylines. We're going to learn about their backgrounds. And we're going to love these two people that begin to love themselves. And nowadays, and probably back then, is when people like really like each other and are attracted to each other, it gets kind of spicy and there's a lot of tension in there. And so they make toast. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. When I refer to make toast, that means that they're having sex. So yes, everyone, I did figure out a phrase that we can use because I am not convinced that I'm an adult yet. So we're going to say they are making toast. And they do make toast a couple times in this. And it's great. It's spicy. It's descriptive. It's a little... It's a lot. Um, <laughs> so this story takes place during Christmas time, which is perfect because we're about to get into Christmas time here. No judgment because I am this type of person, but I do have all my Christmas stuff out. And it's what... November 15th, I want to say. Yes, I put my Christmas stuff out right after Halloween. There's only two holidays in my world, Halloween and Christmas. This book is also set in New York, which I've never been to New York, but you know, I've read a lot of stories about it. I've seen a lot of pictures. I feel like it is pretty bustling. And that's what I get from this story as well. So if you're interested in learning more about window shopping by Tessa Bailey, just keep on listening. The book opens up with Stella, who is walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, and normally she doesn't go down that street because it's super busy, and especially around Christmas time, she just wants to avoid it. But something about today, she just wants to feel that Christmas magic, so she decides to go down. And as she's walking, there's a passerby that comes by her and hits her in the shoulder, and she immediately in her head is like, he's a needle dick. And when I say I laughed out loud, I literally laughed out loud because I don't think I've ever heard that insult before. A needle dick. I mean, it's so appropriate. Once she thinks that insult, she immediately thinks to Dr. Skinner, which we start to think, okay, who's Dr. Skinner? And she thinks about her therapy sessions with this lady and how Dr. Skinner would tell her to not trade emotional currency with strangers because you never get a refund. This Dr. Skinner smells like moldy granola, but you know what? Sometimes she has really great advice. And so that makes us wonder, okay, this is therapy. Why was she going to therapy? We learned that it was a mandatory therapy and she just got out of Bedford Hills Correctional early for exemplary behavior. I don't know if that's a real place or it's just made up in the story, but it makes you wonder, okay, is this like like a detention hall, like probation, prison, jail, like, like for a mental institute, your mind just starts racing. Like, okay, what is this correctional facility and what did she do? You're immediately hooked. This is literally on the first page that she says this. I was immediately hooked. I want to know what she did. So as she steps out of the flow of foot traffic, she starts to look at this window, which the store is called, I think, Vivant. I believe it's Vivant. So she starts to look at this window dressing. There are these penguins that are on this assembly line, 
and it's dressed up obviously as Christmas. And these penguins are mechanical, so they do like a complete awkward swivel and then they revert to like their original position and their expressions are like frozen. I mean, of course they're frozen, they're a fake toy, but in this manical glee, so it's kind of creepy. And so she just is looking at this window and she kind of like giggles a little bit, her mouth twitches. And then all of a sudden this guy pops up, not the guy, not the passerby, just a completely different guy. And he's like, "Uh Oh, you know, I was going to mind my business and keep moving, but you went and head and smiled. And now I have to know what you're thinking. And if it wasn't in this book, if this happened to me real life, I would be like, who is this guy? I'd immediately be creeped out. Like that's understandable. Right. And so she is immediately like, that wasn't a smile. And she turns to look at him and she's just like speechless because she looks at this giant man in a candy cane bow tie with a huge smile. And she's like, am I hallucinating? Like, who is this dude? He's holding this blue and white paper coffee cup. He has dark brown hair with a slight curl at waves. He's wearing a suit that's like impeccable, navy blue, very crisp, not a wrinkle. And he has these smile lines and she notices these smile lines that they fan out to like the corner of his eyes as well. And they're deep and worn in. And she's like, this man smiles constantly and I hate him, which is honestly like so relatable. I don't know if you're the type of person. I'm definitely the type of person where I'm not a morning person. If someone has a lot of energy around me in the morning, I immediately hate them. I'm like, how do you have this much energy? I don't know what you are on. I just, I can't function in the mornings. And so that's what this reminds me of that she's like, this guy smiles constantly and I hate him. It was very relatable to me. And he's like, well, if that wasn't a smile, what was it? Like a twitch? And then he starts talking about his uncle Hank. Mind you, this guy is a complete stranger. Noticed her smile. And then now he's starting to talk about his uncle Hank and his Aunt Edna and this weird story that his uncle Hank has this twitch and he used to spill beer all over and it just is a weird story and she's like okay I really am hallucinating and so she turns back to the penguin and she's just like trying to ignore him and he's just there and wants to tell her about his relatives and she's like I'm not the type of person that looks like I'm approachable. I am fluent in F off. Like hopefully he speaks it too or hopefully he knows how to read body language because so far he's not. And so she looks him like straight in the eye and she puts in her ear pods and turns away from him because hopefully that will give him the message like, hey, why are you talking to me? I don't want to talk to you. I want to be alone. I want to look this window. And he just stands there. And so she's like, you know, thinking about like different things and how this guy is just there. And she still sees him in the reflection and he's just standing there smiling into his coffee like he doesn't have a care in the world. And she's like, my my rudeness didn't even register with him. Another couple minutes pass and he's still there, still a couple of feet away, tilting his head, looking at the penguins and what as well. And so she's like, what what is happening? So she turns to him and she pops out her earbud and is like, can I help you with something? Like, is there something I can help with? And he's like, oh, um, I was just waiting for your song to be over. She's just dumbfounded. There wasn't a song playing. She just wanted him to leave. And she's like, do you have another like pointless story to tell me? And he's like, oh, I have a thousand pointless stories to tell you. She's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> One was enough. And he's like, okay, but after Uncle Hank had that twitch and the beer spilling era and Edna eloped with a rodeo clown named Tonto and he's like I guess you'll never know about that and she's like devastating and so he just like keeps continuing and she's like at this point my I'm pretty sure my jaw is hanging down to my knees and she's like is this a strange kink instead of flashing people you just go around like accosting people with these bizarre tales and he grins and he's like well it's too cold to flash people in December my options are limited like this guy is not picking up this hint and he just is smiling. It seems like he has a good sense of humor. She just doesn't even know what to do. And so he smiles like even bigger and she's like, oh no, 
Like, this guy is handsome. Her stomach flops, like flip-flops, and she's like, no, 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 my stomach has never flip-flopped. I can't have this reaction to this man. No, 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 he is such a strange guy. He's talking to me about his relatives. I just literally barely met him. He's not getting these hints. Like, how am I attracted to him? And he's like, you know what? I did have a purpose for stopping. Um, I'm curious of what you make of this window. And she's like, Penguin Chernobyl? And he just laughs. He's like, yeah, I, I guess that's what I'm referring to. And she's like, you really want to know what I think about it? He's like, yeah, actually I do. And she's like, okay, well, do you work for Vivant? And he's like, oh, you know, in a manner of speaking. So she's like, you know what? Okay, I have nothing to lose. I'll tell you what I think of this window. Honestly, this window is going to drive shoppers away because people don't really want to think about their Christmas gifts being put together on an assembly line. And that's obviously what's being displayed here. People want to pick out something for their loved ones that they believe is unique, one of a kind, not something you can just produce in a factory. And by this point, she's like really on a roll. She's telling him exactly what she thinks of this window. And she's like, that brings me to the penguins. Did you know that the average lifespan of a penguin is maybe 13 years? So this is like technically child labor. And she's like, this is not a good look. And he's like, oh my gosh, you're right. And he's like, hey, are you an artist? Do you Have you ever window dressed before? And she's like, nah, I'm just critical. So he laughs at that. Then he asks her like, okay, well, like what what would you do instead and she's like why why is this guy asking me like why do I care and she's like I guess I have nothing to lose and this line it makes you even more curious because you're like it says a girl with a prison record is never going to decorate a store window at Vivant that opens even more curiosity she has a prison record she was in prison that correctional facility was prison so I'm even more intrigued I'm more intrigued about her record I'm intrigued about this relationship I'm intrigued of how he comes into the picture if she's going to know him more after this I I need to know so of course I keep reading because this is already a very interesting book. So she starts talking to him about reminding the people, the consumers, that buying a president is about the surprise. A surprise is priceless. The moment when someone takes off the lid and gasps, that's what we're all in it for, which I totally agree. So she's like, you know what? I'd display the dress a woman would never buy for herself, but secretly wish that they own. And I'd make that dress a new lifestyle, a new start. Their desired result was on the other side of the window. And then he's like, oh, what would you do with the other three windows? And so she like looks at him and he, he seems really impressed. She's like, nah, I really need to go. And he's like, you should apply. I have it on pretty good authority that Vivant is looking for a new window dressing. And she, she's just like, no, 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 no. I'm not interested. I, I don't want that. And he's like, I think you really should. And she's like, nah, like what, what is it? You're concerned. I don't know you. And she says, all right, I think we're done here. He yells out to her because she's, she's walking away. She's like, I, I'm done with this. And he's like, there's an application on the website. Couldn't hurt to give it a look-see. Like he's that type of person that says like, look-see and folks and ooh oopsie daisy and you just kind of get like a sense of who this guy is so later that night she's just really she has a lot of anxiety she's been thinking about the position she's like you know what I don't have anything to lose at this point and she's like what if I submit the application and they never respond she's like nah that's probably what will happen I'm an ex-convict she sent it anyways and the story starts from here so we're at the second chapter and it opens up to Aiden which is kind of funny because last week's book there was Aiden as well. Maybe it's just a really common name now. So this is Aiden. This is the guy that was on the street talking to her about the window, which we kind of assumed that he would be the love interest. And he comes into his office and so he sits down at his desk. His assistant is there and Aiden is immediately like, it's going to be a good day. And even just from that one sentence, you're like, he is a very positive person. I mean, even from the description that Stella said of him, that he has smile lines, you just know that he's a positive person. On Aiden's computer, he has a reminder pop up that he needs to go through window dresser interviews and their resumes and everything like that. And so he's really, really hoping that Stella put in her resume and he's starting to kick himself because he doesn't know her name. And so he's hoping to be able to just feel that one of the resumes is her. His assistant's like, you know, all the applicants have been vetted. I weighted it down to like the good ones that have potential. And he starts talking about all that. And, and Aiden asks, did anyone stand out? 
And he's like, you know what? I'm not even sure why I asked. There's nothing my assistant could say that could make it, that would make me positive one of these applications belonged to her. He's like, I didn't get her name. <laughs> and then he's trying to convince himself like, okay, I encourage her to apply, not because I wanted to see her again, but she has really insightful designs. Like he keeps telling himself that like, I, it's not because I wanted to see her. So he clicks through the applications. Um, and Leland, who's the assistant, responds and says, like, hey, there's, like, a couple that stand out in the terrible department. Like, the first round of American Idol, this one girl had an honest-to-God prison record. And it says, a jolt went through Aiden, snapping his spine straight. He's like, prison? No, 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 no. <laughs> but the thing is, he felt it. He felt the electricity. He just knew it was her. And even before Leland said her name, he's like, this is her. I know it. Which is very kind of a strange concept when you ask me. But you know what? It's kind of cute as well. He just he just knew. He's like, what? what is her name? Like, do you know her name? And Leland's like, I don't recall. So they go through the applications that didn't make the cut. And he's going through all of them. And he gets to a name, Stella Schmidt, and he just knows it's her. He looks at her resume and he's like, I'm not going to get her phone number off this application and use it. Like, that's creepy. And which is good. I'm glad he <laughs> he told himself that that was creepy because it would have been creepy because he just he just wanted to talk to her some more. And he's like, you know what? I need to be ethical. I need to assure myself like this situation, like I have a dilemma. Like she is the applicant with the, the prison record. And he's like, can I hire her? Can I even bring her in for an interview? Like I can, right? And then he starts to think about the board of Vivant, which consists of his grandma, his father, and his cousin. And he's like, they're sticklers. They're very st stuck up. And he's like, you know what? If Stella is the one with the prison record and I don't interview her uh, based on that, then I'm not listening to my gut, which is telling me she deserves a shot at this position, especially when she was telling him what she would do with the window and has a vision. So he's like, I can't dismiss her just because of the board directors and their preconceived standards. Of course, lastly, he is selfishly thinking that he wants to see her again. So there's only one way to do this right, really, and to give her a real shot at the job, interview her with the same open mind that he interviews everyone else. So he decides to tell Leland, like, hey, I'm going to interview all the people that are qualified and all the people that were in this rejected file, just to make it very open, very equal, very fair. So he meets with all of these applicants. I believe he said that there was like 32. Stella is the last in interview and she's nowhere. So he like reaches down to tie a shoe and he sees something like between the desk, like a, a flutter, almost like a flash of color. And so he looks up and he's like, Stella? Goes out of his office and he hears the stairs door shut. He opens the stairwell and he's like, who's taking the stairs from the 10th floor when there's a good elevator? And so he immediately is like, Stella? She's like, no, 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 I changed my mind about doing the interview. And he's like, well, you're allowed to change your mind. He's like, I, I definitely would still like to talk to you, though. She's like, no, 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 you can't be serious about interviewing me, hiring me. And she's like, you don't seem the type to play a joke like this elaborate on someone. But then again, you know what? I've been away for a while. And she's like, which you obviously know now. He's like, yeah. And and that's all he says. He doesn't like, he doesn't pursue, doesn't ask more questions about it, wants to make her comfortable. And so he starts talking about how his grandfather named the store Vivant because he wanted to impress a French lady named Camille. And it didn't work, but the family was stuck with it. And he just starts talking about his family some more and makes her more comfortable to talk to him. And she's like, you know what? This might be the weirdest moment of my life. But you know what? I've been training cornbread for toothpaste and other toiletries for the last four years, so I don't have much to compare it to. And he just kind of goes silent and she looks at him and is like, are you going to ask me what I did to get sentenced? He's like, no, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope it wasn't a bow tie thief. My collection is valued at 40, some may say $50, which is kind of funny because you remember her first look at him. He has this bow tie and I guess that's his thing. Uh, we'll learn more about it, especially during Christmas. He likes to wear all different kinds of bow ties. So that was kind of a funny joke. And she's like, you know what? Um, you're just going to overlook my record. It's just more special consideration I don't deserve. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're getting ahead of yourself. Like, we haven't even done the interview yet, which is 
you know, totally understandable. And he's like, you know what? Why don't you just show me what you brought? Like, let's start with that. So she hands him this folder and she has her resume. And then she also has these sketches of these windows that she's like themed. And he's like, hey, talk me through one of these ones. And there's a red dress in the center and there's all these cut out butterflies. And she says, you know, give them a new beginning. That's what it's titled as. Next year is all about renewal, fresh start after two years of lockdowns and mass. We're looking past Christmas and the cold weather. Like this is the message for this window is to help your loved ones find their footing again. A lot of people wouldn't buy themselves a bright red dress like that. But if someone else did, it would be a breath of fresh air. Suddenly they're wondering, am I the kind of person to wear a red dress? And the answer is we all are, which is awesome. And we just need help believing it. And a loved one's vote of confidence goes a long way and it can lead to discovering more of your own. And as far as the give and take, studies show that consumers, especially women, do a lot of shopping for themselves while buying holiday gifts. And, you know, they're in the situation that they got their work bonus or they're using holiday stress as an excuse to splurge, which I completely agree when I'm looking for Christmas gifts for other people, I definitely buy gifts for myself, whether I wrap them and gift them from me to me, or I just, you know, use start using them and wearing them and just decide to treat myself. So I completely get what she's trying to draw people into the store and make them want to come back in the new year. He's just very enthralled with everything that she says. And he's like, my first instinct was to give her the job the second she started talking. But I was agreeing with everything she was saying. Like, not only were her di designs well-defined and vibrant, he's like, I'm, I'm an optimist at fault. And I was taught to search for the best in people. When she goes through her design, he's like, how does a trial period sound? And he's like, normally a Christmas windows design remain for the duration of December, but because like the board isn't happy, people aren't coming into the store, we just need to start fresh. Like, and he gives her four days to complete the one window and then they'll go from there. So he, she would start the next day and have them till Friday. She's like, you know what? Thank you. I, I can, you can keep those. I'll see you tomorrow. She immediately starts running down the stairs and he goes back to his office and he's like, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. So the next day, Stella is immediately feeling imposter syndrome. She is just not sure that she can do this. She arrives early, which is great. And she goes through HR, gets her new badge around her neck. She's ta She takes a tour with HR and she just feels like she is so undeserving. And so she goes into the window. She puts up the paper. That's step one. She's like, okay, I can do this. I need to go and talk to the salespeople now to kind of get their vision and find a red dress to put in this window to create this scene. As she's getting this window ready, she starts to think about Aiden and she starts to think about her attraction and fascination with him. And she starts to think about her best friend, Nicole, and how this attraction is so left field from what she usually goes after. And just that thought of Nicole just clips her on the chin and forces her to pause and think about her best friend. And it says like her best friend is still incarcerated and will be for a while. So it makes you think like, okay, did they get incarcerated together? We find out that they grew up together. They shared everything. So the total lack of communication wasn't easy for them. And she doesn't blame Nicole for everything that happened. So it was her decision that got her in trouble. And so she starts to shake herself out of that mentality because it sounds like Nicole really makes her negative. She goes out of the window to look for the sales people on the floor to talk to them. There's no customers yet. And so because she has this imposter syndrome, she's like, okay, I'm going to go up to them. I'm going to talk to them. This is a new start for me. And I'm not going to lead with an apology um, because she always feels the need to explain herself. And, and because she does feel so out of place, she's like, I know I'm going to start with an apology. I can't start with an apology. She's not going to say, hi, sorry, I'm Stella. And then she starts thinking about the designs and, and gets really excited about them. Like, I want to start this off the right way. And so she reached the center of the floor where all of the managers are. And she goes up to 
like the main manager and she's like, hi, sorry, I'm Stella. She's like, dang it. And has anyone ever been in that situation where you're like, I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say this. And then immediately you do say it and you're like, oh my gosh, like what is my, what just happened? That sounds like this is exactly what happened. The manager raises her eyebrows and she's like, oh, sorry, I'm Jordan. I manage the main floor. She is in the same boat. Like they automatically click. And so Stella asked Jordan about the dresses, about about the positions of the merchandise and what would get the most people in and getting more stock, just kind of, you know, talking about her whole vision and everything. And she's like, you know what, if I can pull off this first window and Aiden, and she stops halfway and she's like, oh crap, Mr. Cook likes what I do, then I have an idea to like draw people into this space. And Jordan's eyebrows kind of go up when she says Aiden, because she's like, mm, people don't call him that. They call him Mr. Cook. So she works throughout the day and it gets to be late at night and she decides to call it. She's really tired, she's hungry, and she's done all the work that she can for the day. And so as she is getting things ready, all of a sudden the door stopper moves or like shifts and the door shuts and she's locked in. So she starts to freak out because she has been locked up for four years. Like she doesn't want to feel constrained and and confined again. And so she starts to kind of have a mini, a mini panic and she calls out. Nobody can hear her. The janitor has started his vacuum. She's freaking out even more. She starts to look up the number for Vivant. Somehow she finds a general number and she calls that and then no one is answering. So she looks at her emails and she sees Aiden's phone number. And so she calls that number a couple times. Nobody answers, calls it again. And he's like, hey, Aiden Cook at your service. And she's like, oh my gosh, Aiden, it's me. It's Stella. Like I, and she starts to like really rush herself. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what's wrong? Like, what, what are you saying? And, and she's like, I'm locked in this window. I can't, I can't move. I can't breathe. Like I'm freaking out. Like maybe I just don't want to be locked up anymore. He's like, okay, okay. I'm going to walk faster. I'm coming to you. Like, don't worry. And he stays on the phone with her, which is really nice. And they ask like each other questions. And she's like, oh, are you almost here? Almost here? And he's like, yes, yes, yes. And so he starts talking to her about Aunt Edna again. And he, um, he gets to the window and he opens the door and she immediately like throws herself into his arms. She's just freaking out. And he's like, okay. And he says, okay, sweetheart, which is kind of cute. I mean, they've only known each other for what, a couple days? But he's like, okay, sweetheart. He squeezes her and he's like, you're okay, you're okay. And and she's like, oh my gosh, like I was freaking out. And I just, I couldn't breathe. And he's like, okay, okay. And he still like has her in his arms and he like leaves the window and he walks her up to his office and the janitor's just kind of staring at them and he's like, you didn't see anything. And so he's like still holding her and they get into the elevator and they're still talking and then they, and then they start to, you know, feel the sexual tension because they're like right there there. She's in his arms. They're like talking in each other's ears. Once the, the elevator opens, he puts her on his desk to sit and he's like, you feeling better? Like holding like her shoulder. And then he like kind of walks away and she's like, Oh, okay. I know that we're attracted to each other. It's not just one side. And this is going to be a problem. And there's kind of just like a, a silence as she blurts out armed robbery. And you're like, okay. Like, is she going to tell us what she went to prison for? And she says, um, that's what I was in prison for. My friend Nicole. And then she kind of like backtracks and she's like, no, 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 sorry. We arranged uh, to rob a restaurant where our friend was closing up. It's going to be super easy. We'll make a show for the camera, wave our fake guns around, walk around with the drop, like before he could put it in the safe. Like where it was just going to be easy money. Um, and she's like, it turns out the guns were fake. And our friend's boss came back because he forgot his phone. He took a gun out from beneath, from beneath the register and fired at Nicole. She, she panicked and fired back and it hit him in the side. But you know what? He lived and she just kind of like sits there looking for his reaction. And he's like, um, what happened after that? And she's like, you know what? The rest is history. Like she didn't, <laughs> she didn't want to talk about it anymore. And this is kind of like, Ooh, okay. But he's like, he's like, I want the rest Stella. And she's like, wait, does he want the rest of the story or the rest of me? Like, what does he want the rest of? Um, because she, you can already feel the sexual tension with like the situation with him holding her, with them talking some more, getting to know each other. And you're like, okay, whoo. 
Woo, you can feel it. The next day is a board meeting. And just the way that he describes his father and his grandma and cousin, you immediately hate them. And you find out that when he was young, he was sent to his Aunt Edna because his dad just just couldn't handle him, I guess. I don't know if his mom passed away. I don't know what was happening, but his dad just couldn't handle him. So he sent, um, he sent him to Aunt Edna. And so he's stressed about this, this board meeting and his, his assistant is like, you know what? Like they're conveniently forgetting the fact that you bailed out Vivant five years ago and they treat you like they did you a favor instead of the reverse. So we, we know now that Aiden came back and basically saved the store. And so his family is on the board, but they're just treating him like crap. And so as he's getting ready for this board meeting, he keeps thinking about Stella and the situation they were in the night before. And he's like, you know what? I hired Stella so I could see more of her. But basically it turned on me because because hiring her made her off limits, though. And even kissing her would be a violation of company policy. And he's like, no, 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 that's an abuse of power. I just can't do that while I'm in this position. And so he goes into the board meeting and he's like, okay, like, like, where do we want to start folks? And his dad's like, folks, where on earth did you come from? And his grandma's like, ah, it's Edna's influence, Bradley. The fault lies with you for sending him down south with that loon for so long. And Aiden gets pretty mad because he's like, because he he wants to stick up for Edna, but he knows that it just won't get him anywhere. And he's like, okay, moving on from family matters. Like, let's get down to business. So he starts to talk about like holiday numbers, everything like that. He's like, you know what? We hired a new window dresser as you requested. She's taking things like in an interesting direction. And his grandma interrupts him and is like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. The last girl was an abomination. Who's the new one? And she just starts like interrogating him. And he's like, I'm not going to tell my grandma about her. Like I, not because I'm afraid they'll disapprove of her, although they definitely would. But he's like, you know what? I feel very protective of her. He's like, I'm not even going to put her in the radar of my grandma. He's like, and he's like, sorry, I have a conference call shortly. Would you mind if we power through this? And I'll update you on like the window designs at the end of the week. Like, let's just move on. And his grandma kind of like does a little huff and it kind of makes you suspicious. Like, okay, what's going to happen with the grandma? So later that evening, Stella is still working and she gets a phone call from a Connecticut number and her heart just drops because she's like, the only Connecticut phone number that I know is the correctional facility. So it could be Nicole. And so she starts like thinking about Nicole some more and starts to like have a little bit of anxiety. She's also trying not to think about Aiden, how the next day is when the window is going to be presented. And so she starts like doubting herself more. It was as if she could hear Nicole like ridiculing her saying like, stop trying to be something that you're not. We're the same. You and me, you think you can change, but you can't. People don't change. Like just basically tearing her down. It sounds like like that was their relationship as they were growing up. She's like, no, I, I gotta, I gotta get out of this window. And so she starts just walking the aisles of the store and she hears this clink and she looks over and there's these shoes. And so she co- goes around like the display and Aiden's just sitting there with a bottle of bourbon. She's like, <laughs> are you having a rough day? Like what's happening? And he's like, uh, yeah, kind of, there was a board meeting. And so he starts to talk about his family some more and they sit down and, and he just, you know, tells her about Edna. He tells her about uncle Hank, about how Edna never planned on having kids. She was a, she was a pretty free spirit. It definitely, when he was sent there, it definitely shocked him because he was coming from this really tense and sterile environment. And all of a sudden he was in the care of a woman who collect wind chimes and embrace nudity and laughs at inappropriate moments. But she always gave him her best and about how he was like down in the dumps when he arrived to Tennessee. And he said like, none of the other kids in my new school wanted to hang out with the lanky Yankee is what they called him. And so he, he really didn't want to go to school when he was young. And, and then Edna just knew and she started putting him in a bow tie. And she told him, you know what? No one can be anything but happy while wearing a bow tie. He thought she was crazy, uh, but he had nothing to lose. So he tried it and the bow tie made him feel like someone else. It was kind of a shield in the beginning. Uh, they weren't making fun of him. They were making fun of the kid in the, some kid in a bow tie. And when the kid laughed along with him instead of like skulking off, the outcome was better. He just kept wearing bow ties and it conditioned him to be a good sport all the time. And so she's like, oh, 
It, you know, it, it makes you feel guilty, doesn't it, being anything less than happy. And that's why you don't want to be around your family. He's like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I'm impatient and irritated around my family, and that makes me feel really guilty. And she's like, you know what? You can't be better all the time. No one can, right? And she's like, maybe it's okay to loosen up once in a while and let yourself feel or express some bad stuff. It'll only make the good stuff more valuable. And so she's like, you know what? Let's play a game. Let's run around the store and pick out a potential Christmas gift for each other. We won't buy it for each other. We'll just pick it out. And so he immediately starts running and she goes and finds her gift. And then they meet back in like the little lunchroom and he's already there. He's made her cocoa. He has her present right there. Like he just, it took him no time. And she's like, okay, like let's, let's do this. And she opens hers and it's this like necklace kind of keychain thing. It's really nice. He's like, it's a fur around your neck. I thought you could wear a key to the window box so you don't get locked in. Then she gives him the present that she got him and their binoculars. And she's like, you know, cause you're always looking up. And so they kind of laugh about it. And she's like, okay, well, tomorrow's the window unveiling. Like I, I gotta go catch the train. He kind of cuts her off and he's like, I'd already given some thought to what I wanted to give you for Christmas. That's how I found the neck chain for your key so fast. And then he's like, oh, I shouldn't have told you that. And she's like, why? Why didn't you want to tell me that? Is it because of the rule? Like I read it in the handbook. It's like the non-fraternizing rule. She's like, yeah, it's it's there. Like I, I read it. I read it all. They would have to like sign this contract and the two people would be free to do whatever they want. And he agrees and he's like, yeah, it, it's a contract. Uh, releasing the company from liability. He's like, yeah, whatever they want. And she's like, what do they want? And so you can kind of feel this sexual tension again. And they just kind of like are staring at each other. He's like, I only know that I think about you to the point of distraction. He's like, I need to be extra vigilant, especially because I'm the boss, like an imbalance of power. You're like you're the employee. Throw in the fact that I hired you with that some people might call with a black spot on your resume, whether you're qualified or not. And of course, I think that you're qualified. I have to worry about on some level, like you might feel in debt to me, which you shouldn't. But if I took advantage of that and he just starts talking, he just starts rambling and she's like, no, 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 it's fine. Like, you don't owe me anything. I'm going to prove myself. And then there's just more sexual tension. And he's like, name one other rule in the employee handbook besides the non-fraternizing policy. And she's like, um, I can't. And so they're both saying like, like, okay, we're, we're both curious about this. You know what? No matter what happens tomorrow, I know I didn't take shortcuts or pass on any ideas because they were too hard. I know I did my best effort and I have the sore back to prove it. And he leads her to like a taxi car and, and he's like, okay, I'll, I'll see you in the morning. And she gets in the car and then in her pocket is the keychain. Um, that he bought her and it was super cute around the time that they need to be there at the window he decides to go and he sees her standing out there by herself outside of the window and he's like hey get in the car like it's it's I have donuts and it's warm in here and she's like okay and so they just start talking about how the window is going to be amazing and he finally tells her like hey the board decided to be here for the unveiling like I found out and she's like you know what I don't want any special treatment would you be acting like this between any other window dresser and the harsher parts of their job and he's like no no you're right and she's like okay don't protect me from this like I can do this and so, of course, they start talking about, like, Christmas and how special it was growing up and everything. And she, tar and she starts talking about, like, growing up and about being a teenager and the thought of being parted from her friends for even a day turned her into, like, Godzilla, which I can totally relate to when you're in high school. Like, your friends are everything. You don't really care about your parents. You don't care about being home with your family. And I really, like, related to this. She said, it's weird. When you're younger, you think you know everything. Then you get older and live in constant awareness of how little you actually know and understand. He's like, who's, who's Nicole? Like, tell me who Nicole is. And she's like, she's my best friend. She came from a difficult family situation. Um, like her father had substance abuse issues, couldn't keep a job. She was over at Stella's house a lot, eating, spending the night. Her Stella's parents were very open and generous and, and let her stay there a lot. And they were there for her as much as they could. And 
uh, when when Nicole started to party and shoplift, like Stella went with her, which is what best friends do. And they had each other's backs. And somewhere along the way, Stella just got absorbed into it. And she never told Nicole that she was taking on like college courses because she felt that. And she's like, that's when I knew something was wrong with our friendship. The fact that she wouldn't like me pursuing my dreams, but I couldn't break it off. And then it was too late. And we held up the restaurant. And so then they they start to get kind of hot and heavy. They don't kiss or anything, but there's a lot of sexual tension again, which at the beginning I told you there's there's a lot of sexual tension in this book. And before they, they get out of the car, she's like, you know what? Remember, you don't have to protect me from criticism. Let me hear their opinion. I have to be able to handle it. So they get out of the car and they reveal the window and it's amazing. They're excited. They know that this is going to be great for the store. And Aiden's dad like walks over to the grandma and he's like, I worry this is like a desperate grab for attention. And Aiden's like, uh, I think we can all agree that store windows are supposed to be an attention grab. They exist for that very purpose. And he kind of puts him in line, which is really funny. And he's like, and Aiden says, you know, the window is going to boost our foot foot traffic. Like we're going to prove it. Like in the meantime, I'm, I've seen enough to make Stella a permanent hire. Stella is of course so excited. And Jordan, the manager is like, Hey, let's go for drinks after work. So after work, they're all sitting there, all the managers with Stella, Jordan, Aiden's not there. And so I was like, okay, maybe they didn't invite him. He is like the head manager and everything. And so she's talking to all the people and Jordan's like, oh, I wonder if Mr. Cook is actually going to be here. And she kind of, she looks over at Stella and kind of gives her a look and, and Stella's like, what? And Jordan's like, don't worry. I'm the only one who saw you in the backseat of his car this morning. And they kind of like bond over it. Um, and she's like, I know, look, it's complicated. Uh, it can't go anywhere. And Jordan's like, no, 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 you don't have to tell me like your work speaks for itself and I'm not judging. Okay. Like your secret's safe with me. And so Stella goes to, goes up to get a drink and this guy comes over and tries to like hit on her. And of course, like in the exact moment, Aiden comes out, he walks over and he like tells the guy basically to scram. And so the guy like leaves and she's like, you're kind of out of line. And he's like, is that your type? Like, is that is that the kind of guy that you like? Honestly, I haven't really been around men very long. I don't know what my type is anymore. And he starts to like freak out, not like verbally or anything, but inside he's like, oh my gosh, like I freaked her out. Like I'm coming on too strong. Like he's like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have said that thing. And he's like, I'll see you at work. And so he turns around to leave and she's like, you're my type. And like blurts that out. He's like, wait, what are you saying? Like, hold on. And she's like, you know what? I'm not ready for like HR paperwork, like contract. Like I suggest like, we just work this attraction out between us. Like without any paperwork. He's like, no, no, no. Like that's not my reason for wanting the paperwork. I don't want this thing to between us to be dishonest or something that we sneak have to sneak around behind the scenes. Like I want, I want better than that for you. Like you deserve better than that. And she's like, uh, well, I'm not really in the position to make a personal commitment that big, like filing the paperwork. He's like, okay, like, I get that. I get that. We can't really do anything. And she's like, I know, I know, like, you're a really good guy. But then, it, you know, s- sexual tension again, that's a reoccurring theme. They like go to this back corner of the bar. They kiss for the first time, like through all the sexual tension, they haven't kissed at all. But then they kiss and they're like, well, we should probably go to your house. And Aiden is kind of like doubting himself. And he's like, can I do this? Like we, we can work through this. We don't have to do the paperwork because of course he's like a a goody guy. Like he, he doesn't want to go against policy. He doesn't want to feel like he's taking advantage. And so he's like, okay, like I I can do this. And so he's like, I'm going to go downstairs first, wait five minutes and follow me. I'll meet you outside. And she's like, oh, okay. Like, let's do this. So they, they meet downstairs, they get to our apartment they get upstairs, they're talking some more, they start making out, things get hot and heavy, and then they kind of like cool off for a second, and and she asks him like, when are you unhappy? He's like, you know what, I've never really admitted this out loud, but Vivant was in trouble five years back, and um, his grandpa had passed, and they're honestly getting ready to close the doors. He had made some money on the side like down in Tennessee with his aunt Edna. They were beekeepers, and he went door to door selling that that honey and mason jars 
and they had enough capital to package it and sell it in like trade shows and they sold out. And anyway, so he basically got rich and was able to buy out Vivant with this honey money and save the store because he he felt like that would like bring the family together and make his grandma and his dad like want to be around him and to talk to him and have this family time that they could get closer. But of course, they're still unhappy. I thought this was a really cool quote. She said, you know what, sometimes people just aren't in a place to receive happiness. It's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's just that they don't want to feel it, or they don't recognize happiness when it's handed to them. So they take a foreign feeling and turn it into something that makes them comfortable. They wouldn't know themselves if they stopped obsessing over their own shortcomings or their past mistakes and just let you in. They don't know how, but it can't be your job to teach them. Like you get to take advantage of your own happiness. You're allowed to keep it if they don't want it. And so they, you know, are opening up, being really vulnerable about each other and and they start kissing again and they get really hot and heavy again. And, and he just can't go through with it. He's like, you know what? I guess I'm just too nice for you. And he decides to walk out of the apartment. He's like, you know, I probably just blew it with the girl that I really like. You know, I got to stick true to myself. I mean, at this point, I'm like, oh my gosh, just do it already. Like, and then sign the contracts later. Like, maybe that's just me. But I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, if you guys really like each other this much, like, geez. The next day, it's Stella's official first day as a full employee at Vivant and Aiden comes out and he's like, Oh, are you okay? Like you look upset. And she's like, no, 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 I'm not upset. He's like, you know, I probably ruined things between us last night, but believe me, like I am still thinking about you. I'm kicking myself. Like, but I am, I'm sure that I did the right thing and it's better for you than the secrecy and the lies. And she's like, no, it's fine. Like, really, I'm fine. Like it, I just have a lot of work to do. And he's like, okay, well, here's this invite to Christmas Eve party. Like it's this Friday. And she's like, you know what? I'll, I'll try my best to be there. Like, and then she looks at the invite and she's like, oh, uh, it says a plus one. Like, he's like, uh, yeah, I'd rather you didn't. Um, he's like, I don't really have a right to ask you that, but I'm, I'm not ready to let go of the belief that you're mine yet. So, you know, for my sanity, please don't bring another person. So the next couple of days, Stella is just working on her window. Um, she's working on it. She's just sitting down for lunch and Jordan comes in and starts to catch up on life with her and about how the store is doing. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, the human resources lady comes in with security guards and she's like, the one in the green shirt, that's her, Stella. She's our only employee with a criminal record. I'd like her to be searched. And Stella's heart drops and she's like, wait what? And Jordan was like, I'm going to go get Mr. Cook. The HR person was like, yeah, I ran an inventory report and we're missing two very expensive pairs of earrings, diamonds. And she's like, Stella was here after hours every night for a week. Like she, she must have found a way to get into like, into the locked cases and take them. No other explanation. And so I was like, what? I didn't take them. I don't have access. And the HR lady is just not listening to her. Like, no, 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 you found a way. So yeah, Jordan's already gone to go get Mr. Cook and Stella is just so, she's like, I didn't do this. Like, how do I prove that I didn't do this? And so Jordan runs up to Aiden and was like, she didn't do this. She didn't do this. Like they're accusing her of this. And Aiden's like, wait, what? And so he runs down. He goes to the back where they're holding Stella. Aiden's grandma and his dad are there. Uh, with the HR and, and Stella and Jordan. And his grandma's like, well, apparently we can't trust you to keep our affairs in order. And dear Roxanne, which is the, the HR person, uh, was kind enough to give me a call and let me know the issues that were being overlooked. And like the fact that we have a felon being hired behind the board's back. And Adam's like, uh, I'm responsible for hiring and I don't need permission or approval. And his grandma was like, well, apparently we need to change the hiring process. And of course, his dad was like, yeah, I knew something was off. Stella's like, Mr. Cook, like I, I didn't. And he's like, don't say another word, Stella. And so he looks over at Jordan. He's like, lock the registers on the main floor. Bring the sales staff in here. And he's like, I want all of them. I want all of them in here. And his grandmother's like, oh, well, they're working. The store is packed. Like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? And he's like, 
Mrs. Bunting, which is the HR person, he's like, um, when did you run the inventory report and find the earrings were missing? And he's, and she's like, uh, like you can tell that she's uncomfortable. She's like, well, last night around five 30 before I left for the day. And he's like, okay. So even though I was working upstairs until like, I don't know, 11 o'clock and my personal phone is always open for calls. You decided the best thing to do was alert my grandmother about the issue. And his grandma's like, well, Roxanne here has been working here, like, since me and your father ran the store. And he starts to get snippy because he's just about had it. And he's like, yeah, ran it into the ground, you mean? And his grandma just, like, freezes, like, wait, what? Like, what's gotten into you? And he just, he's had it. He's like, Mrs. Bunting might have excused the breach in protocol if you didn't seem gleeful about an employee being falsely accused of stealing merchandise. You may keep your position through New Year's, and then I suggest you find another place of employment. You don't represent this company in the manner it deserves, or rather that the employees deserve. So basically, he's like firing her in front of everyone and saying like, no, nope, sorry, you don't cut it. Like, bye. And his grandma's like falsely accused. Like the girl was in and was in prison. He's like, yeah, first of all, she's done her time and she came out with enough courage to try again. So he's like, second, grandma, I'm glad you noticed that the store is packed because it has a lot to do with Stella's window and the attention it brought. He's like, you know what? We're not going to have any more board meetings after this. Like, no, 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 we don't need them. And she's like, you can't just cancel. And he's like, actually, I can. I own 60 percent of this company and I, I bailed your butts out. I held those meetings thinking it might bring us closer together as a family because that's however that's all I ever wanted. But you know what? I'm no longer interested, not even a little bit. Meaning something to you means less to me. So thank goodness you sent me to Edna. So by this point, all of the all of the salespeople are in the room. And he's like, okay, listen up, everyone. Like, no one's gonna get penalized. Like, did anyone show two pairs of earrings and forgot to lock them up? Like, he just starts explaining. And someone in the very back says, like, oh, were they diamonds? And and he's like, yes, they were. And, and this girl steps up and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, a man put them on sort of, like, an unofficial hold yesterday. I know we're not supposed to do that. They're in the back of Register 3. Like, I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. And he's like, no, it's okay. Like, thank you for telling the truth. No one is getting fired. Like, you can all return to the, the floor now. The HR lady and the grandma and dad are just, they just look so chastised. And, and of course, they're not going to say an apology to Stella and the grandma and, and dad leave and the HR was like um I think I'm just gonna work from home the rest of the day and Stella was like actually there's something you can do before you leave and she's like I want one of the contracts like the relationship contracts Aiden was like no 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 like I don't want to be because I what I did today like I don't want you to feel obligated and she's like no not at all like I don't I don't feel obligated I didn't take the earrings and what you said about the windows you're right maybe I haven't quite earned my right to be here yet but I am I'm doing it she's like I want to sign these papers because you believe in me and and with that like I can believe in us I can try my best he's like you know what Stella you're gonna succeed with or without me and if I didn't give you this job you would have found another way in or somewhere else like I'm just grateful I was the one who gave you this shot because it's how we met but you don't need saving I support yes and I need it too but not saving and so of course like once they sign the paperwork they head up to his office they make toast so after they kind of like do their thing and she decides to tell him more about what she did um to to go to prison and so she said like you know when the restaurant owner was shot Stella actually called 911 and waited with him um he was she was holding her sweater over his wound and she didn't leave with Nicole. Nicole left. Later that night, she goes to, you know, spend the night at his house. And, and she asks him about, like, what his perfect Christmas would be. And he's like, you know, I just want to have a family that we can all wear matching robes. The next couple days, they just spend a lot of time together. And it's that Christmas Eve when they have a company party later that day. And so he's he's still walking around work and, and doing some reports. And she's trying on a dress. And he comes in and, and watches and um, compliments her. And they start talking. And, and she gets a phone call. And, and she's like, Nicole is at my house. Like, I have to go see her. And he's like, wait, no, like, I don't want you to go if you're going to get hurt or in trouble. Like, please, please don't go. And she's like, you know what? I have to do this. I have to talk to her. 
I have to figure this out and get this relationship good. And he's like, I, I want you to come to the party tonight. Like, please tell me you'll be there. And she's like, I just, you know, I, I haven't decided if I want to go. Like, I'm still like inching forward with things. Like, I, I just barely got out. Like, I'm just, he's like, okay, like, if you need more space, like, I'll, I'll give you more space. Like, I understand. And she's like, what? No, like, that's, that's not what I mean. And, and he's like, okay, like, well, I just, I, I hope you'll be there tonight. And she's like, look, 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 you've been my hero since day one. You know, you've given me a place to heal. And, but if I'm going to stay here, I'm going to need to feel like I, I earned the second chance. I have to be my own hero. Like you need to just have faith that I can do this, that, that I can go and talk to Nicole, that I can figure out the situation that I'll come back to you. Like, please. And he's like, you know what? Okay. Like, I will figure this out. So Stella goes back to her building and Nicole is there waiting for her. And of course, Nicole, she's like, wow, you already, you already have an apartment. And so I was like, yeah, it was a godsend. Like it was my uncle's. I don't know what I would have done without it. And Nicole's like, yeah, I don't know, Stella. Like, even if you didn't have this apartment, you would have figured out something, right? You've always been lucky like that. A lot luckier than me, that's for sure. Stella, you know, at this point is just about to like snap. And she's like, you know, yeah, I am lucky. You're right. And she kind of like talks about her job a little bit. And Nicole says like, wow, you're a big deal, Stella. You must be super important. Nicole, of course, is like, you don't even want me here, do you? Like, it's obvious. Like, you don't want me interrupting your perfect life. All I've ever been to anyone is an interruption. I thought you were different, but I guess I was wrong. Like, as she just starts going on, going on, and Stella's like, stop. Like, stop saying this. And she's like, Nicole, you're my best friend. And if you're going to be in my life, I need you to understand it's going to be, my, my life is going to be separate from yours. I need you to understand that we're two different people with separate choices. Like, you can stay here while you we find you a place, while you get a job, but I'm not abandoning myself for you either. Stop feeling bad for yourself and putting it on me. Like, I'm not having that anymore. Like, do you understand? Like, she just calls her out. And I'm like, yes, girl, yes. She's like, you're strong. You can do this. You can be someone you're proud of. Tomorrow can be a great day. And Nicole's like, you know what? I can. I can do this. I understand. Like, okay. And she just gets it. Like, immediately gets it. And usually there's, like, a, a fight or an argument or anything. But I think at this point, she's just so low. Nicole is so low that she just gets it. She's like, yeah. I, I need to change. This isn't getting me anywhere, like acting like this. So I, I need this. And so I was like, okay, like I'll help you. Like there's some food in the fridge. Like I've got somewhere to be like, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow. We'll make a plan. And so then it, it cuts to like Aiden and he's at the party and he keeps like looking up at the stairs and, and just hoping that Stella will show up. And he's like, you know what, if she doesn't like, I'll figure it out. A Edna is there. Um, she seems like a, a really kooky character, which we already know. She's like, come on, get it together. Like we're at a Christmas party, like figure it out. Let's go dance. And he's like, um, and then he just, he just knows when Stella is there. And so he like looks up at the stairs and she's there, she's smiling at him and she's wearing a robe and she's holding a robe for him and it was matching. And so she like goes to him and and he's like, I, I don't want space. Like, I, I don't want it. I don't need it. And she's like, yeah, me either. And this is what's strange, which of course this is like a book. They say I love you already. And I think it's only been like two weeks. But you know what? Love at first sight, soulmates, it could happen. You know, it just uh, it happens more often in these books and not real life. But, you know, what do I know? Um, And so, you know, they spend Christmas together and they just end up really happy. And, and then there's an epilogue where a year later they go in and talk to her parents and everything like that. So yeah, that was this book is a pretty quick book. Um, a lot of sexual tension. Once again, the story is great. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you look up this book and, and read it and get to know the characters more because I, I skipped over a lot of details that are super cute, super fun. And I definitely recommend this book and recommend just picking it up on like Kindle and it would be a pretty quick quick read and I definitely think it's worth it especially during the Christmas time season it's just fun and it puts you in a good mood thank you for listening to episode three and I'll see you guys next week